The United Nations General Assembly holds an emergency special session on Russia's military operation in Ukraine. The President of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, reaffirmed his country's commitment to the defense of fundamental rights in the framework of the 49th regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Israeli occupation forces repressed groups of Palestinian citizens in occupied Jerusalem on Monday. Hi, this is from the South. I'm your news anchor, Dio Martin, from the Tulsa Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. The United Nations Security Council began an emergency meeting concerning Russia's military operation in Ukraine. The special session continued on Tuesday with more heads of state to speak before the international body. The measure convening the General Assembly session was adopted by a vote of 11 in favor with Russia against, and China, India, and the United Arab Emirates abstained. The meeting gave all members of the global body the opportunity to express their views on the military operation in Ukraine. Russia voted against the resolution, but under UN regulations, it did not have veto power to derail the referral of the war to the General Assembly. And speaking before the United Nations Security Council, the Russian ambassador to the UN, Vasily Nebenzia, stated that the root of the current crisis lies in the actions of Ukraine itself. The root for the current crisis lies in the actions of Ukraine itself. For many years, it sabotaged and flouted its direct obligations under the Minsk package of measures. Just recently, very recently, there was a hope that in Kiev uh, they would reconsider and that they would indeed comply with what they signed on to back in 2015. For that, first and foremost, what was necessary was direct dialogue as set out in the document between Donetsk and Lugansk. However, the latest confirmation from the senior leadership of the, uh, of the country was that Ukraine was unwilling to engage in this dialogue and they took st uh, uh, unwilling to take steps to grant special status to Donbass con and, uh, as set out in the Minsk agreements and this was actively supported by the Western patrons of Kiev and this definitively persuaded us of the fact that we no longer have a right to allow the residents of Donbass to suffer any further. And at the General Assembly's special emergency session on Ukraine, the Ukrainian ambassador to the organization, Sergei Kizlitsy, had described and condemned the attacks carried out by Russia during his intervention. Distinguished delegates, Russia is using all its military potential to attack Ukraine and has started to deploy reserve units on the border with Ukraine. It launches missiles against the cities and attacks with aviation tanks and artillery and with reconnaissance groups that mark residential buildings to prepare for area bombardments. Also in the United Nations special session on Ukraine, Syria's representative to the UN, Bassam Sabah, made an official statement about the issue, supporting Russia's claims and criticizing Western states' hypocrisy. Curious about today's session is that despite successive crises and major challenges that the international community has been facing for decades, and where the Security Council has failed to take on its responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. Western states have never demonstrated so much excitement in calling an emergency special session of the General Assembly. This shows a politics of hypocrisy, of double standards, as well as one based on interests and not principles. Also, during that special session, China's representative to the UN, Zhang Jun, talked about the need of a political solution to the Ukrainian crisis. Против боли есть Аскафен П, обезболивающая с парацетамолом по доступной цене, и Аскафен Ультра, усиленный состав. China expressed its firm opposition to the U.S. fabrication of false information in order to tarnish the Beijing's image on the Ukrainian issue, said Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin at a regular press briefing in Beijing on Monday. 
China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi reaffirmed support for all diplomatic efforts necessary for a peaceful resolution to the Ukrainian crisis. He also denounced Washington for what he considers to be a revival of tensions around that conflict. Thus, the Asian diplomat rejected all of Japan's accusations of nuclear exchange with the United States. China firmly opposed U.S. fabricating false information in order to tarnish China's image. I have noticed that U.S. foreign affairs experts Thomas Friedman and Tulsi Garbart, former members of House of Representatives, recently criticized the U.S. administration for its role in Ukraine crisis. We urge the U.S. to take a hard look at itself. As I stress, China always decides its stance and policy on the merits of an issue and always stand on the side of peace, cooperation, fairness and justice. And on Monday, Cuba reacted to the start of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. On his Twitter account, the Cuban Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla, on behalf of the government, welcomed the positive outcome of the start of negotiations between the governments of Russia and Ukraine. The Cuban chief of diplomacy considers this is the only way to solve the conflict. Russian and Ukrainian talks ended in Belarus and the two parties returned to their capitals for consultations. According to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's advisor, Mikhailo Podolyak, their main goal was to discuss a ceasefire and the end of combat actions on the territory of Ukraine. The parties determined the topics where certain decisions were mapped out. In order for these decisions to be implemented as a roadmap, both delegations returned for consultations to their capitals. The parties also discussed holding another round of negotiations where these decisions can develop into more feasible plans of action. And finally, on Monday, Ukraine entered the European Union, pressuring these after Russia's special operation to eliminate the emerging threat against Moscow. We have been waiting for this 30 years. Today, I signed the application for Ukraine's memberships in the European Union. We have fought our right to be together with everyone in Europe as equal. The application has already been presented in Brussels. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In Geneva, Switzerland, the United Nations Human Rights Council agreed to hold an urgent debate on Ukraine. On Monday, the United Nations Human Rights Council voted in favor of conducting an urgent debate on Russia's special military operation into Ukraine. The motion was proposed by Yevgenia Filipenko, a Ukrainian ambassador to the UN. The initiative was rejected by Moscow's representative to the United Nations, Gennady Gatilov. Meanwhile, millions of civilians, including vulnerable and older people, are forced to huddle in different forms of bomb shelters, such as underground stations to escape explosions. UNHCR reported that 422,000 people have fled the country, and many more are internally displaced. My thoughts go out to them and to all those across the world who suffer. In the framework of the 49th regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council, the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, reaffirmed his country's commitment to the defense of fundamental rights while assuring that the coercive measures imposed by the United States affect the population. In his speech, the president underlined that Venezuela's participation in this council is aimed at guaranteeing respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. The Venezuelan head of state also denounced the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures on the country's economy, while stressing that these measures have prevented access to food, medical supplies, and equipment in recent years. Unilateral coercive measures illegal, criminal, punitive, and extortionist sanctions against our economy and our people. Measures that have blocked access to food, medicines, medical supplies, and equipment before and during the pandemic. China once again refuted accusations that it violated human rights in Xinjiang and oppressed freedom in Hong Kong. 
At the 49th United Nations Human Rights Council meeting in Geneva on Monday, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi reaffirmed China's stance on both the Xinjiang and Hong Kong issues. Wang said Xinjiang has seen rapid economic growth over the last 60 years, and the population of Uyghurs in the region has increased from 2.2 million to about 12 million. China has said multiple times that it welcomes people from outside the nation to verify the claims on the condition that they don't hold any bias. So-called genocide, forced labor, and religious repression are lies that are completely fabricated. The door of Xinjiang is open. We welcome people without prejudice from various countries to visit Xinjiang and have exchange. China also welcomes UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mrs. Bachelet, to come to China soon and pay a visit to Xinjiang. In Chile, the Justice Systems Commission of the Constitutional Convention will discuss an article that proposes replacing the Senate with the Territorial Council. The representative of the Mapuche people, Rosa Catrileo, presented the proposal. The initiative responds to criticisms against the Senate and aims to limit the powers of the Chamber of Congress. The article proposes replacing the upper chamber of the legislature with a territorial council that will have powers at the regional level and will intervene directly in matters such as the budget law and other fiscal regulations. And on Monday, CARICOM Secretary General Dr. Carla Bennett announced the 33rd intersessional meeting of the heads of government of the Caribbean community to take place in Belize on March 1st and 2nd. Dr. Barnett announced on a streaming conference uh, agenda for the meeting. The topics include the impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic on the region and recommendations to expedite recovery of regional economies, advancing the CATICOM single market and economy to help build a more resilient community, advancing the CATICOM agri-food systems agency with emphasis on regional food and nutrition security. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi, welcome back to From the South. Israeli occupation forces repressed groups of Palestinian citizens in occupied Jerusalem on Monday. According to local media, several minors were injured and detained during the violent Israeli operations at the so-called Damascus Gate. According to information from the Palestinian Red Crescent, a total of 31 people resulted injured in the repression and four had to be hospitalized. In Sudan, protesters were killed in an anti-coup march while thousands of demonstrators were trying to cross a bridge across the Nile linking the city to Khartoum. At least 84 demonstrators were killed since, uh, 20, have been killed since the October 25th military takeover, according to independent medics. Last week, UN rights expert Adam Adyeng, during a mission to Sudan, expressed concern about the violations committed by the authorities and the use of live ammunition against protesters, as he put it. Both the UN and the United States have made similar appeals before with Washington threatening further consequences if violence continues. Protests calling for civilian rule remain steady. In Ethiopia, the government denounced the increase of crimes against civilians allegedly perpetrated by the Tigray People's Liberation Front. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs assured that efforts to achieve stability and grant humanitarian assistance to citizens do not cease. However, the authorities have explained that the situation has become complicated due to the constant attacks to the different aids sent to the people in Tigray. Officials also point out that the government hopes to establish a national dialogue with the aim of guaranteeing security for the general well-being of the country.
Cuba's health authorities reported that 89.2 percent of the population has a complete vaccination schedule against COVID-19. According to the most recent reports from the Ministry of Public Health, more than 34 million doses of national vaccines such as Sobanana 02, Sobanana Plus and Abdallah were administered on the island. The health ministry also reiterated the effectiveness of Cuban immunogens, which it affirms do not develop side effects that seriously affect the person's health. The government of Guatemala blames anti-vaccine groups for the expiration of Sputnik V doses. One million doses of Sputnik V vaccine against COVID-19 that Guatemala brought from Russia expired on Monday, and the Central American government blamed the anti-vaccine groups that generate disinformation about immunizations. According to the authorities, a vaccination campaign in the country has encountered several myths and rumors and presented some cases in which health personnel were assaulted in some communities. In Brazil, the death toll rose to 231 following the tragedy of February 15th landslides and floods in the city of Petropolis in Rio de Janeiro. Authorities reported that most of the victims are women, while 44 minors died as a result of the rains. Officials also detailed that 876 people are still sheltered in municipal schools in the region. Petropolis declared a state of public calamity after an estimated 260 millimeters of rain fell on February 15th in a period of just six hours, more than the amount projected for the whole month of February. In Australia, thousands of people were evacuated on Tuesday after the devastating floods. Towns in the northern parts of Australia's most populous state were affected by floods, officials said. Emergency crews continue working to rescue people stranded on roofs and on bridges in the towns of Woodburn and Lismore in New South Wales. State Premier Dominic Perrottet said 40,000 people have been ordered to evacuate, while 300,000 others have been placed under evacuation warnings. And United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. Today's report underscores two core truths. First, coal and other fossil fuels are choking humanity. All G20 governments have agreed to stop funding coal abroad. They must now urgently do the same at home and dismantle their coal fleets. Those in the private sector still financing coal must be held to account. Oil and gas giants and their underwriters are also on notice. You cannot claim to be green while your plans and projects undermine the 2050 net zero target and ignore the major emission cuts that must occur this decade. We've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstra English. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. Tell us your English, I'm Dio Martin. Thanks for watching.